time is merely an illusion. Even though this is already our third season here at Camp Kennan, for us, it is really just the beginning. That's why we're so excited to continue this adventure. There's still a whole world full of animal lovers and reptile enthusiasts like yourselves out there waiting to be met. And it is our pleasure to tell their stories as well as the creatures they cherish. Today, we kick things off with a legend from up north. Welcome to season three of Camp Kennan. I'm Kennan Harkin. I'm here with my pal, Clyde Peeling. Now we're in the middle of Pennsylvania and for those of you who know about the show, know that I was a professional BMX rider and I trained in central Pennsylvania. Now there weren't a lot of reptiles floating around, a few rattlesnakes and some milk snakes and so on, but when I wanted my reptile fix, I came to reptile land here in Allenwood, Pennsylvania. Today, I'm gonna to show you just what Clyde did to this amazing facility. We're gonna hear just how tough it was to start it up in the frigid north of Pennsylvania. A good portion of my life has been all about action, which still holds true. But now I pour all that time and energy into wildlife conservation, education, and the pursuit of knowledge. This is Camp Tenor. Clyde, you've always struck me as one of the godfathers of you know, reptile knowledge here in the United States. You were one of the first guys to really build uh, a facility like this. And how did it all start from you? Is it similar to like all reptile guys? Well, I started uh, working at a small roadside zoo. And in many respects, it was the, the epitome of what roadside zoos were right. in the 1950s and 60s. And I always thought um, there was greater potential than the owner of that place was taking advantage of. And I have to say, when we started, we too, we, we framed it pretty much along the lines of the people I worked for. Right. And I quickly realized I wanted to, I wanted it to be more than that. I wanted to have a real zoo uh, and, and do real education. And uh, so we, we uh, at, I think 1986 we finally achieved accreditation with an organization that's now called the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, was then called AAZPA, but, okay. um, and then every five years we've gone through this accreditation process, which is very rigorous. They look at every aspect of the operation, they want to see aesthetics, they want to see record keeping, safety protocol. Um, you know, visitor uh, services, uh, you name it. They look at your bookkeeping, your wow. animal records, and uh, so we we have gradually grown over these 51 years from what was once just this little place with a board fence surrounding it to what you see today and we're still not finished. You know, and that's the thing that always impressed me years ago when I came here. You know, I, I gotta be honest, I thought when I first walked through your doors as as you know, just a customer, yeah. that I was going to be seeing a roadside zoo, but I was so impressed. And I think those of you who follow along, you know how passionate I am about how you keep animals and, and giving information. And Clyde has always been good at that. He's always been good at, you know, creating nice habitats for the animals here in Pennsylvania. And then just the little things, which I really love about the place, is there's so much interactive things you're doing mm -hmm. here. Just the little finesses that the kids and the parents are really learning when they come to your facility. But this is all from a lot of hard work, you know? A lot of hard work and being very lucky to have a lot of good employees through the years and uh, two sons that are, are very innovative and active in the business. Um, I have to say we wouldn't be where we are without uh, them coming along about the time wow. their old man was starting to wear out. Oh, I hear so. you. Well, let's keep walking around because I, I love some of the habitats that you've created. That was always my thing, and I think many of the people out there who are into reptiles, uh, it's almost like there's a part of you that you want to be surrounded by nature, and, and reptiles, to me, and I've said this before many times, reptiles are interesting when they're interacting with their environment. You know, I, I, I would agree. I, yeah, we don't really get excited, you know, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I just don't get excited seeing a snake in a, in a plastic bin. I want to see a snake in a beautiful habitat or lizards in a beautiful habitat. Case in point, you know, you have these beautiful... Well, I think it trees. puts the animal in co the context of its uh, environment, right. its niche yeah. in the wild. And uh, it is a little more educational than just showing them with a uh, 
a plain floor right and and no uh, interior furniture and and you were mentioning about the AZA accreditation they actually want this as well that that's is that part of the uh, is that part of their mission statement, or is that something that you kind of just That's strive part for? That's our uh, cool. program. Uh, now, I think AZA is primarily concerned with the, the health of the animals and maintaining genetic diversity in breeding programs. Oh, okay, gotcha. You know, the other thing that really interests me about you, you know, you, you're kind of a calm guy, you know, you, you have a calm demeanor, but I do see this fire in your eye whenever we're talking about the science of these animals. Like, the last time we met, it was about five years ago, you were starting to talk about the new way that scientists are looking at how they classify organisms, clades, I believe, mm -hmm. yes. and that really stuck with me, and I, you know, maybe you can explain to, uh, very, you know, to our, our viewers just what well, clades are in, in we, layman's terms. We term. used to say a reptile was cold-blooded, came from an enclosed egg, right. and and had, was covered with dry horny scales. Today we would say a reptile's ancestors had scales. It can be warm-blooded. Birds are now classed as reptiles. Uh, it can be cold-blooded, as many of them are. Uh, those terms are not very scientific, but uh, that's what most people would say, cold-blooded and warm-blooded. Um, so, uh, as I say, birds are now um, one of the, the uh, the groups of reptiles, reptiles that we we used to separate completely. What were clades have to do with the evolutionary relationship of the animals? And since we've been able to examine DNA, uh, we can pretty much determine where they branched off from uh, an ancestor, uh, an ancestor and went off on their own. Wow. And uh, it's just a whole way, a new way of looking at uh, taxonomy. Really beautiful. So we have a red spitting cobra here. Yes, and wow. this was captive uh, born, and I believe it it hatched probably in the Bronx Zoo in New York. Oh wow! And um, you know, maybe you could tell me. Uh, I always love stories of your, you know, like um, what was it like to be in the middle? You know, Central Pennsylvania in the '50s and '60s was probably even uh, I, more isolated um, than you would think, right? Indeed, and it's still isolated. Yeah. Um, if anybody. Uh, has dreams of building a zoo, I would encourage them to get to a large population center. <laughs> gotcha. Don't repeat my mistake. But, <laughs> but I've been here now over 50 years and I'm probably not going to pick up and move. Right, right. You have such an amazing collection. Look at this beautiful yawn from a Gaboon Viper. Look at that. I love These it. These are beautiful snakes. Yeah, and the, the green mamba and the gaboon get along just fine. They oh, occupy different niches. Yeah, I didn't even notice that. Let's talk about that. That's really cool. I mean, and those are some of the biggest fangs. Uh, they're probably the largest fangs in the uh, venomous snake kingdom. That's, that's yeah. true. Wow. So this is neat. And this is something else that excites me. I didn't even notice this, guys. But, you know, these are both an African species. Yes. Okay. And uh, here you see an arboreal animal with a, a very cryptic colored forest dwelling floor animal. And so I love multi-species exhibits. That's I always excited well, me. Sometimes it backfires. Okay. We, uh, we always kept a, a rat snake in with the cotton mouth. Uh -huh. And one day, uh, there was no more cotton rat snake? Mouth, uh, cotton mouth ate a rat snake. Okay, yeah. But generally, uh, the, the rat snake is hidden back in a little hole right now. But generally, they, uh, they do occupy cohabitate. the same habitat and they do fine. Cool. That's really cool. See, these are little things that, you know, when we're, when you're being, if you're a hobbyist or if you're a businessman or doing this professionally, I always like to kind of strive for that perfection, right? You guys know that when you watch the show, it's all about creating cool habitats for the animals because as we will stress so many times, man, uh, these animals need enrichment, okay? Just because you think that they're a pea-brained reptile, I just do not uh, subscribe to that belief. I love to see the animal move around and interact. Some you can you can see more going on. Right. Uh, the king cobra, for example, when a king when you're looking at a king cobra and he's looking at you, you know that just by watching the, the pupil shift slightly, this animal is cognizant of what's yeah. going on outside of its enclosure. And if you guys want to watch me uh, learn about king cobras, go back to season two, first episode, and that is exactly right. It'll. Uh, Tom Crutchfield called it uh, a monster of God, and it'll put the fear of God in you. But yeah, there, there is an intelligence. And you know, it's just the way it goes. I mean, some of these reptiles you spend so much time with, is that something that you'd like to tell uh, maybe young keepers or people starting out? Um, 
really, to learn about these animals, you have to spend a lot of time watching these animals. You do indeed, but um, I think if I were going to encourage any young person who really wanted to get into uh, reptiles, think seriously about picking species that are in need of conservation efforts and become part of a species survival plan uh, which is connected with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And, and what that means is you're taking advice from geneticists. They're asking you to breed this animal with an animal maybe owned by somebody halfway across the country. And uh, if we can do that, and if, if we can involve the private sector, we could truly have sustainable populations. Zoos cannot do it by themselves. That's fantastic advice, man, and that's something that I've been striving for. You know, uh, just so you guys know, it is possible for privates. That's how I got my start, is I identified the Turtle Survival Alliance, since I love tortoises, and I work with them uh, very heavily to do exactly what he said. This is incredible. Thank you so much for walking us around, and I know we're going to spend a little bit more time with you. We're going to have a few episodes with Mr. Peeling here, uh, so stick around next week. We should have something very exciting. In the meantime, thanks so much, Clyde. I really, I always enjoy hanging out with you, man. Okay. It's a wealth of information. See you soon, guys.